We're in Ezekiel chapter 24, and we're going to do just a very short little synopsis of chapter 23 for those that are following along on the internet and those that are here on this, because it's so important to understand the heart of God when you're going through what we're at. We're finally here in chapter 24. We are at the time where the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem that Ezekiel's been warning Israel for all this time, it's happening here in this chapter. Chapter 23, before this, he, he kind of gives us a thing like a judge saying, it's now, it's no longer the, the judges hearing their case and all the rest. The verdict from the judge came in chapter 23. And we called that the cup of, of judgment. That's our little bit of a review. This concept, the cup, a cup of judgment, is throughout the Bible, and we picked several areas so that you could see that it's throughout the Bible. Yes, it was in Ezekiel chapter 23, the cup of judgment, but we wanted to take you a couple other places where it's also at. In Psalm 75, verse 8, uh, David talks about a cup that's filled with spices, with, and it's a greater and more severe effect on the drinker. Kind of like the cup's already poisoned, but it spiked poison beyond that, so that it wouldn't just poison you and kill you. It's, it's extra severe. That's the way David describes the cup of judgment. Isaiah also describes the cup of judgment in Isaiah 51, and he says it comes with a double calamity. So in other words, it doesn't have just a, a, a judgment in itself, but the double calamity, and I, I didn't take... Uh, much time on that last week, it really is, it means that it brings something for you and those around you. It's like judgment and wrath never really just strikes a single person. It's like it has a total effect on a city, on a nation, on a household. We think sometimes we sin in isolation, and our sin affects nobody. That's kind of today's popular concept. It's my sin. It doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, the Bible kind of tells you that's different than that. That your choices have consequences and they do affect others. And when it comes to the time of wrath, it, there's a double calamity that takes place according to the prophet Isaiah. And then Revelation in the end gives us two chapters that actually connect together. And it's talking about the woman who's riding the beast. And I shared with you last week that I believe the woman that's riding the beast is Israel. Because I believe Ezekiel 23 is where she drinks the cup of God's wrath for the first time. And in Revelation 17, verses 3 and 4, then Revelation 18, verse 6, it says there's a golden cup. And it says it's filled with abominable things, and she will drink a double portion. That little clue there within the double portion actually alludes to that she's drank from this cup before. That's why I believe that the woman riding the beast is Israel who has a relationship with the Antichrist that they believe he's the Messiah for them. And they've drank from the cup of wrath here during captivity that we're in, while they're in Babylon, Babylonian time and here in 588 B.C., they're drinking of the cup for the first time. Revelation says they're going to drink a double portion. And it really alludes to the thing, not a double portion at that moment, but they actually could have drank from that same cup before. So with that, let's get into Ezekiel chapter 24 tonight. I'm so glad it has a different uh, setting and language than chapter 23. If you want to hear chapter 23... Here's the advertisement for it last week. It was probably the more graphic. Uh, if, if we were giving it a rating, you would probably give it an R rating if it was at the movies, if they made a movie of, of what uh, God was talking about. Uh, I mean, the title of the chapter that we gave it was The Parable of Whoredom. Ooh, that kind of tells you, you know, it's not one of those ones that you say, kids, let's stay up and watch this together. Uh, and it really was God starting to pour out all of his pain and hurt that his chosen people have totally rejected him. So we pick it up here in chapter 24, and this is now what you've been listening and waiting for all this time, that 
that the Ezekiel the prophet's been warning them. And so we're going to read the first uh, 14 verses here, and it reads like this, In the ninth year and the tenth month on the tenth day, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, record this date, this very date, because the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. Now I'm going to stop and give a little commentary in here. Whenever God gives a date, he's given it for a reason. He doesn't throw out dates in the Bible just because he wants to give dates. Here he alludes to, I want you to make sure you write down this date. If you want to do something fun, if you want to find out hidden trails within the Bible, read the Bible looking for when there's a date given to it. And then see if that date connects with any future event out there. I'll give you one because it actually applies to our name, the Ark. In Genesis, you got to figure where. It's got to be, has to come at least after chapter 6. And it's actually, I think, between chapter 8 and chapter 9. Here's what it says. On the seventh month and the seventeenth day, Noah's Ark came to rest. Why do we care it was the seventh month and the seventeenth day? Here's what was happening. The world was under God's wrath and it came to judgment and when the judgment was over, the ark rested. 4,000 years to the day in the future, that's Resurrection Sunday. The world is still under wrath and the judgment of death, but one paid the price on that exact day that you that we could rest about our sins because they were paid for through Jesus Christ. So there's so many things like that, but I just thought I'd throw that one out here since since this is so important for what's happening in here. It's important in Ezekiel's life, it's important in Jerusalem's life, and it's going to be important again for the future of Israel here in this, that he gives that it was the ninth year, the tenth month, and the tenth day when the word of the Lord came. All right, verse 3. Tell this rebellious people a parable and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Put on the cooking pot, put it on, and pour water into it. Put it into the the pieces of meat and the choice pieces, the leg and the shoulder. Fill it with the, the best of these bones. Take the pick of the flock, pile wood beneath it, for the bones bring it to boil, and cook the bones in it. Let me tell you, there's a two parts there. They're using parts of the bones for the fire, and the meat with the bones on it is going into the pot. So that if you're not catching, it's a double thing of what they're using the bones for there. All right, Verse 6. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now encrusted. In, in the King James it says a rusty old pot. Whose deposit will not go away. Take the meat out piece by piece in whatever order it comes. For the blood she shed is in her midst. She poured it on the bare rock, and she did not pour it on the ground. That's significant. We're going to look at that here. Where the dust would have covered it. To stir up wrath and take revenge, I put her blood on the bare rock, so that it would not be covered. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Woe to the city of bloodshed. The city of bloodshed, if you didn't know, this is Jerusalem, the capital of Israel here, all right? They've now gone from the holy city to the city of bloodshed during the captivity here. All right. Um, I, too, will pile the wood high. So, heap on the wood and kindle the fire. Cook the meat well. Mix in, in the spices and let the bones be charred. Then set the empty pot on the coals till it becomes hot and its copper glows so that its impurities may be melted and its deposits burned away. It has frustrated all efforts. Its heavy deposit has not been removed, not even by fire. Now, 
Your impurity is lewdness. Because I tried to cleanse you, but you would not be cleansed from your impurity, you will not be clean again until my wrath against you has subsided. I, the Lord, have spoken. The time has come for me to act. I will not hold back, and I will not have pity, nor will I relent. You will be judged according to your conduct and your actions, declares the Sovereign Lord. All right. Now, even though they call it, in this one, they call it the parable of the boiling pot, um, many scholars and the guys that I really trust in says that he's actually asked, like remember early in Ezekiel, when he was asked to act out what was taking place, he was asked to not only speak this, but act it out again. So this is kind of, he's telling it as a parable to those that are in captivity by the river Kabar. Uh, this is what the Lord is saying, and he's acting all this out. Let's go through this right now. When he says, mark this day, the Jews know that day by heart. It's January 15th, 588 B.C., a day of national shame. It's the day of national shame. It's the day that they record the temple, the first one, the one that God gave who to build? Wasn't David, remember? Solomon, okay, good. Solomon to build and all the things in it and the presence of God and everything that went there, that this is the day. The day that he's writing down is the day for the Jews to, to now, in remembrance, remember a day of national shame. Okay? Number two, this is the day, the last 20 chapters, from chapter 4 to chapter 24, and almost a five-year period in history has been pointing to. So, in the great white throne judgment, all those that live through captivity, they can't say, you didn't warn us. You didn't tell us. You guys were saying, when's he going to stop, right? 20 chapters of warnings in different ways and different things that were connecting the dots in future warnings that would come also. All right. Here's the players here. The pot itself is Jerusalem in the parable. The fire is God's wrath. The bones are the people. The impurities or Man, King James uses the word so often in this one instead of impurities, scum. <laughs> if you got a King James version, when I hit that thing, you're going, wait a minute, King James saying this is the scum in the pot. It's the sins, it's their sins. And so this is what's taking place. The wrath of God is now upon them. It started on that day. Ezekiel is telling them something and they're hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem. He knows this only through the Spirit of God, and that's why God said, write this day down, because it will be commemorated and declared so with, by a witness. It has to be a witness. Did that really take place on that day? Now, the interesting part at the end of this parable that's acted out, he talks about the blood that is not covered. The blood that's not covered in the Bible has a promise that comes with it. It's a promise of being avenged. Isn't that interesting? So the blood that was covered doesn't need to be avenged. So someone has to avenge the blood or how they would, they put this little twist. I love how theologians do this. They put this, there. it's pointing to what Christ is going to do his blood is going to be that which spilled out upon the rock in place of our blood that it has to be avenged someday. That's the great white throne judgment wrath on one day. So you see how an event, the blood being poured out, it symbolizes a blood that has to be avenged, but it's actually pointing to the one that will spill his blood on the rock, Golgotha. He wasn't on a dusty hill. He was on a rock and his blood would be spilled, not covered, that would be avenged, and it's avenged through the great white throne judgment. Wow. 
powerful connections through the Bible in just those first 14 verses there. All right, let's pick up and, and, and watch what happens on this exact same day here, starting with verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, with one blow I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary food of mourners. So I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. Then the people asked me, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Why are you acting like this? That one question right there is again telling you the little hint that it wasn't just a spoken parable. He had to actually do the visual for them to watch it like he did earlier when he had to lay on one side for so long and then the other. All the crazy visual things that God had them doing early as a prophet. Okay, And so they're saying, why are you acting like this? So I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me. Say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affections. The sons and the daughters you left behind will fall by the sword. I titled this section Enduring Grief because he's going to ask Ezekiel something here that I really believe God's all-knowing, his omniscience comes into play when he picks Isaiah. There's a, there's a Bible college uh, professor in Florida. His name is Randall Smith. Um, if you can find his stuff, it was really hard to find on YouTube because it's, it's attached to the Bible College there in Florida. I think it's Faith Fellowship Bible College. Uh, I think it's a charismatic Bible college. But this guy is an amazing Bible teacher. He teaches the freshman and the sophomore classes, and in that two-year period, they go verse by verse through the whole Bible in two years. That's their Bible part of their portion of Bible college. That's pretty powerful. He wrote a story from this that God laid on him. It was about a three-page story about Remember the man. We think of these prophets, you know, these mighty men of God, like they don't have emotions and everything else. Remember his story. Ezekiel starts out with a 25-year-old guy that's taken into captivity, that has been studying and preparing, that he feels called that when he turns 30, he wants to be a priest. He wants to be in the temple. But he's taken captive out of Jerusalem and taken to Babylon and he's just newly married at 25. Him and his wife are there. Five years go past. He's thinking, you know what? All these that are here from captivity, they need a priest. That's, I've been studying. I'm ready for being a priest. I will do all that we would do in Israel. I'll do it here with them. Ezekiel 1, 1 starts out with, on my 30th birthday... The word of the Lord came to me and says, Ezekiel, I'm calling you to be a prophet. No, 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 no. I'm a priest. I'm a priest. I got this beautiful bride. We're going we're gonna to do all this stuff. She's going to bake the bread that we need for the different ceremonies. She's going to help me. We're going to be a priest. We're going to be all this. And he's called me to be a prophet. Priests were beloved by the Jewish people. Prophets weren't. Then God gives him one of the hardest prophecy tasks to speak to a people that he tells them up front will never listen. How would you like to have that assignment? Go speak to these people and no one's going to listen. Now, in this portion, on that day, the date that gets written down that is the day that Israel will always remember that their first temple, the temple, was destroyed and desecrated and gone. That's why it starts off with the date here in chapter 24. For Ezekiel, that date has the double meaning. 
as you read it in the King James, it actually gives the word stroke kind in there that it says with one blow, it says with one stroke. There are many scholars that believe that God in his omniscience knew what kind of man he would need for the captivity. He knew that this man Ezekiel would be married and he knew his wife wouldn't live long. And in seeing everything, there's nothing in the future that takes God by surprise, folks. He, he doesn't go, I didn't see that one coming. He knew that on the day that he would destroy the temple because of their sins, and that's what the captivity was all about, to draw them out of the land, put a judgment upon them that they should never, ever forget. He knew that this young man's wife would die on that day. He, and this young man's heart is the heart of a priest supposed to minister to the people. And he says, I'm going to pick him. And as, you, as we close out this chapter here, you're going to see some of the things, but let me, this sets up the enduring grief of this young man. Remember, it was probably 598 B.C. when he was taken in captivity at 25. This is 588. He's only 35. No, yeah, 88 to 25. He's only 35. Him and his wife. To become a widower at 35. On the day that's the hardest day for a nation, he loses his... And there's a phrase that's here that's really powerful. So point number one, in the morning he acts out the boiling pot and in the evening his wife dies by a possible stroke. In the NIV it uses the word blow. In the King James it actually says and there was a stroke. I took her with a stroke. And many of the eschatologists believe that, again, God in His all-knowing knew that she was going to stroke out on that day. But He gives her number two. Ezekiel is told to grieve silently, which goes on for three years. He's not allowed to tell anybody or to say anything about his wife's death for three years. He doesn't even know when the end's going to be. It's going to be when God tells him, and we're going to see that God's going to tell him when that time that he could actually really, literally, finally now grieve. You know, in his day, it was important for them to rend their clothes, to throw the ashes up, to be able to get it out. And God said, no, you can't even cover your face, your beard, your mustache. You can't, you can't show these people that you're mourning. Now, Here's the phrase that you see in, in uh, number three here. He lost the delight of his eyes, his wife. God lost the delight of his eyes, Jerusalem. And those in captivity are learning on this day from Ezekiel, they lost the delight of their eyes, the temple. Everybody is going to endure this grieving that's taking place. When I went through this, I didn't know how to, how to bring this to uh, an ability for us to just even grasp the immenseness of this whole subject because we don't deal with what the Bible says about grief really at all. We, we don't talk about it, maybe at a funeral. You know, that's, and of course, Ezekiel's wife's dead and... Uh, the people in Jerusalem are dead, so I guess you could say it was a funeral. But it's interesting, as I went through all the many, I mean, dozens upon dozens of scriptures about the spirit of grief. Here's the three main things that kept reoccurring, and so I put the outcome of grief here for you. Grief takes the fight out of people. Number one, that's what the scripture teaches. Man, you can go through the Psalms, you can go through Lamentations, you can go through Isaiah, you can go through Proverbs. This is the number one thing, that grief takes the fight out of you. When you're grieving, there's no more fight. You're in, that's the, that's the, really the essence of when you're at that point of grief. Number two, scripturally, grief returns us to what we truly value. All of a sudden, you're reassessing life, aren't you? 
When you're at the point of grief, you're reassessing what's really important. Is it important that I work 80 hours a week and, and bring home this kind of stuff? Or should I have spent more time? If I would only known my child was going to die, if I only would have known my wife was going to die early, if I only would have known that, that the sickness would have came and taken somebody, I would have spent more time. And so grief allows you to reevaluate. Number three, only God can restore the joy after grief. Some carry grief for the rest of their life because they don't look to the restorer. I've met, I've met people, I've, I've heard stories of widows and widowers, both that said, I'll never marry again, I can't get over it. I can't go over what happened, how it happened, and, and I can't move on. They were stuck. And I, you know, many times I, I've thought to myself, Lord, how do they get unstuck? It's there in the Scriptures. Only God can restore the joy that grief took. Hmm. So there's many other different aspects. If you want to do even a word study, do it on grief. We really don't, like I say, Funerals are about the only time that we deal with it. What a powerful place that it comes in here in such a way that we're seeing a prophet's grief, a people that lost their holy city, their temple and everything, that they're in captivity, and a God that is letting you know He's grieving also. Now, we pick it up for just a few verses here, verses 22 through 24. I, I know it says 27 in your notes, but I'm going to pause in the middle of that because there's something I need to share with you on it. In verse 22 it says, And you will do as I have done. You will not cover... Do you catch this? God is not grieving at this point. Either. You're going to do what I have done. As I have done, you will not cover your mustache or your beard or eat the customary food of mourners. You will keep your turban on your head and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn or weep, but will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourself. Now watch this, verse 24. Ezekiel will be a sign to you. You will do just as he's done. When this happens, you will know that I am the Sovereign Lord. Wow. I was telling you about this Randall Smith, the Bible college professor that takes him through this, and he wrote this love letter about Ezekiel. As he's going through this, he says, God, I, I gave up the priesthood. I became a prophet. I have to give up the delight of my eyes, my wife. And he takes you back to his mentor. Many believe that Ezekiel and Daniel grew up hearing the words of Jeremiah. He's the old prophet, the contemporary prophet during this day and time. He's the old school guy that's holding it, that's been telling way before Ezekiel or Daniel was even born that God is going to judge Jerusalem and He's going to take them into captivity. That's, <laughs> that's Jeremiah's first 20 years of ministry, talking to people that's not going to listen. And he says this, he says, this is the professor, here's Ezekiel, gave up the priesthood, gave the crazy messages, did all these years, these things with his wife, and lived the life as a prophet. And then God asked him and said, with the rest of your life, you will be a sign, a remembrance of what took place this day. And he says, remember what Jeremiah says, can the clay say to the potter, you can't shape me like this. I had such dreams as a young man, you can't shape me like this. And then to say that my rest of my life is going to be a marred clay that I'm a sign to these people for the rest of my life, I will be the sign? I watched that professor cry and weep when he said, I pray every day, God, don't ask that of me. And, and he says, I realize when I'm praying that, I'm saying, God, there's things that may still be before you that I can't get to that place of surrender, that I want my life to be a total sign to a world that this is what 
you need to remember. I felt like crying a couple times today as I, as I was looking at this and thinking about grief and saying, wow, really at this point, you and I don't know and Ezekiel doesn't know how long is this not even being able to let grief out, let alone he's going to be marked for the rest of his life as a sign. That's why I paused here. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 33. Put your finger in chapter 22. You got to get all the way out to Ezekiel chapter 33. Go ahead to the next to the next screen. 33 verses 21 and 22. Now watch what it says in the 12th year of the exile on the 10th month and on the 5th day. He's telling them now on the 10th day would have been exactly Three years. So it's five days shy of, because remember it was the ninth year, the tenth month, and the tenth day. Five days short of that, a man who had escaped from Jerusalem way back here when it, when it actually happened, a man came to me and said, the city has fallen. Now the evening before the man arrived, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he opened my mouth before the man came to me in the morning so that my mouth was open and I was no longer silent. The testimony of what God gave the captive people three years earlier, the witness came and says, yes, that took place. I escaped. I didn't know where to go. And he ends up here almost three years later. So his ability to speak about what he lost doesn't start till then. Wow. All right. So back to chapter 22. I, I just want you to see that, that that's uh, amazing that what, uh, chapter 24, I mean, uh, and, and uh, verse 24 is where, where we left off. In verse 25, listen to this as it, this closes out. We just heard Ezekiel, you'll be a sign. And you, son of man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes, their heart's desire, and their sons and daughters as well, on that day a fugitive will come to tell you the news. <laughs> but the fugitive didn't get there, you know. So he doesn't know. Each day he's looking for this man to come. And God doesn't give him insight to it till the night before he comes, almost three years later. Verse 27. At that time, your mouth will be open. You will speak with him and will no longer be silent. So you will be assigned to them and they will know that I am the Lord. I think probably one of the hardest callings in life in the Old Testament was probably the calling of a prophet until... I heard this, that God called Ezekiel to be a sign, an ongoing sign to a people that were sinful. This last section, I call it a broken vessel. I wrestled with this for a long, long time. I've, I've actually tried to stay away from Ezekiel except for the end of the book where it talks about the Gog and Magog, our future events, and, and the millennia, because this portion I remember it left things that I go, that's not the part of the Bible you want to read. <laughs> but that's the part of the Bible our land needs to hear, doesn't it? Our people need to hear this today. And Chuck Missler said something as I was listening to his on this very last part that he would be assigned. And with his wife being lost by a stroke, he, he's one of the scholars that believes it was a stroke. Um, under broken vessels, here's, here's the question. How many are willing to be used of God to be assigned to lost people of the power of brokenness? When I thought of that question, I thought, man. And all of a sudden, something lit up in my heart. The reality is, can you and I really trust someone that hasn't been broken in some way? When I think of the false prosperity preachers and the people that are out there that sometimes that they always just name it, claim it, bag it, 
tag it, whatever, you know, and, and they have it. It seems like they've never dealt with a disappointment. And, and as I was wrestling with all this, God, God spoke really clear to me. He said, the things that have come into your life that have broken you is what made the mosaic. It's the broken pieces that come together that makes the beauty of what God can restore. And without brokenness, do we really have anything to offer a broken world? Now, I'm glad he doesn't call all of us to have the brokenness of Ezekiel. <laughs> I think that's a rarity. But brokenness is a part of every Christian's life. When we see our grandkids go places they shouldn't be going, or our own children, or within our own marriages, and things happen, and you say, how can this be? And so within this being broken vessels, again, wow, so many scriptures out there. I picked two out of Psalms, and I picked it because I really believe David understood brokenness. And to me, brokenness always isn't just an event that you're broken because someone died or this or that. There's usually the element of sin in our brokenness that we know we were apart from God or we willfully chose to do some stupid stuff, some very sinful stuff. And that's David's life in this first one that I give you here is Psalms 51, 16 and 17. This is the one where, where David's pouring out his heart about what he's done and, and that he kills this godly man, Uriah, and takes Bathsheba as his wife. And, and he's going to go on and say, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. But listen to what he says in here in verses 16 and 17. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So he doesn't care about the great and lofty thing, but that we come to him in our brokenness and say, who can mend my life, my marriage, my heart, my family, my portion of my world, other than a God that understands you see, Ezekiel was in many ways the image of Christ. He represented the sign that his delight, his spouse, died as God's spouse. The Israel people in Jerusalem and, and the southern kingdom was destroyed. That God grieved over people chose sin over him. And this is so powerful that David would be able to, through the Holy Spirit, pen such powerful words. And earlier in Psalms 34, 18, he put, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now that crushed in spirit it can be deceptive in this way. It's not that you're, you don't have any more will or whatever. It means... Pride's not motivating you any longer. It's no longer of, wow, look what I've been able to do. Look what I can do for God. Look what I can achieve for my household. Look what I've been able to bring to the table. It's the crushed spirit that if there's anything, it, Paul says it this way, who I believe in the New Testament, he's our example of, of a human being that says, if there's anything noteworthy, if there's anything praiseworthy, if there's anything that I should talk about, it's God. Think on these things. They're God, if there's anything noble. And I really am in awe how much God shows His brokenness over what's happened to humanity back there. And it's such a typecast or a foreshadow of how we should be viewing His heart as we look at the very near future of a great tribulation. Some Christians get it wrong and they go, God's finally going to you know, he's finally going to come down and smite these nasty people. And he's going, no. It's the final blow that they haven't accepted, that they won't accept. So the world has to see there's a consequence to our choices. And he brings judgment and wrath. 
it's not an aspect of what God looks to say, I enjoy doing this. It's an aspect of Him being true that sin cannot be prevalent. It will be destroyed one day, totally, and cast into the lake of fire, along with hell, Hades, and the serpent, and all the others that followed that. So, very sober in chapter 24.